raised by my grandparents. My mother and father followed the seasons. They took uh, migrant workers upstate New York and didn't want us to be exposed to that, so they left us with our grandparents so that they could make sure that we had a stable home environment. Growing up in Homestead, first of all, and then Florida City with my grandparents, there are seven of us, six girls and one boy. And I'm the eldest. Uh, of course, they can't call me old. They have to call me the big sister. So growing up, uh, skinny, very skinny, long legs, pigtails. And it was a very happy childhood. It's, a one, it's amazing how you don't realize how the, the problems that you have in your community reflect on you as a child when your parents tend to keep you away from that. You never know that you're poor when you have a lot of love and support in your family. So we never understood uh, until later on when we grew up as older children what discrimination was really all about because we were very protected as children and some things just were not allowed. So with my mother following the season, uh, my grandparents bringing us up, we had a very stable home environment with both parents, the grandparents there in the family, and they were very protective. Well, uh, growing up in high school is probably when we st really started to feel it because then you're more exposed to being on your own, becoming independent, uh, going downtown, going shopping, going to the bus terminal with my mother probably was my first experience when she was home uh, off the season. And we were traveling to Key West and I remember very, um, very definitely that there was a sign that said colored and we were on the colored side and there was another sign that said whites only and as a child my mother scolded me because I slipped under the banister to go and drink from the white fountain because I wanted to find out whether or not the water would taste any differently so that was my exposure and I didn't understand why my mother was scolding me because all I wanted was some water and I didn't understand the difference. But I later understood because of how uh, we were treated, how we were beaten, how we were easily arrested as a people. And from that point on, it was a realization for me. I guess I was about 10 or 11 uh, at the time. And throughout high school, um, although we did not get that much uh, exposure. We, we were extremely concerned about the difference in the treatment and how the schools were different. And going through school, there was one thing I can say that I had a very good education, even though it may have been a separate education. Teachers knew your parents. Um, they stayed in contact with the community. They would tell your mother or father if you misbehave. So there was an opportunity for it to be more like a village uh, and the family raising a child because the teacher would always come back and report if a child misbehaved. And they took a personal interest in your growth and development. And I think that's something that's missing today. So exciting. First of all, let me say that I am the first child in my family to go to college. Uh, so that was exciting for the entire family, getting ready to go to college, going and labeling your clothes and everything. It was so exciting for, for everyone. And to go away to Atlanta to school, um, it was just like I was going to a foreign country. I was leaving my family. I had never been away before. Uh, it was sad, but it was joyous all at the same time. But to happen to go to school during the 60s, during the Martin, Martin Luther King era, and to go to Atlanta of all places, his place, his home, where his church was, that was extremely exciting. And to go to Morris Brown College, which was a part of the Atlanta University system. And I don't know if you know about that or not, but you have in Atlanta, you have Morris Brown College, Clark College, Spelman College, Morehouse College, and Atlanta University, as well as the Theological Seminary, all right there in the same area. So although I went to Morris Brown, I was able to take classes at Clark College, to take classes at Spelman and Atlanta University. So I did not just have one school that I was able to go to. I went to multi-colleges multi in order to get my education. And the exciting part of the Civil Rights Movement, I was right in the heart of it. 
I would be on the campus about to go to the library and I would hear the singing, We Shall Overcome, in the background. And I'd look down Hunter Street and I'd see just a long line of students singing and marching. And they would go through the campuses and they would pick up additional students. And they would march for the demonstration and of course I jumped right in line with them. It was just so exciting. It was such a tremendous time of my life. I would not trade it for anything in the world. To be a part of that, to be a part of that history and to see it uh, in its life form was simply amazing. Well, looking at how things were, were going in the community, the fact that we had a lot of people who were out of jobs, who uh, did not have greater opportunities, my education gave me an opportunity to also give something back, to give something back in a different way because immediately I knew that I needed to be around young people. I wanted to work with young people. I wanted to have an opportunity to influence their lives in some way. So I started out in Head Start with the Head Start program. Uh, initially, when I first got out of college, of course, I did some substitute teaching until I could find a permanent job. And that permanent job landed me with the Head Start program. There was a program called, it was started um, as a part of a national anti-poverty program. It was called the Economic Opportunity Program Incorporated, EOPI. And it was designed to try and uh, give a balance to the disparity that had existed between the haves and the have-nots. So the, that program, the War on Poverty, under President Lyndon Bain Johnson, had programs such as Head Start, Meals on Wheels, Foster Grandparents. These programs still exist today, as well as youth opportunity programs uh, and neighborhood enhancement opportunities. So EOPI was an umbrella organization on a national scale that was designed to try and bridge the disparity between the haves and the have-nots. And it was very successful and very touted in, today, in the day. So I was fortunate enough to get with the Head Start program. It started in 1964, the law was created, 65. Um, of course, it got up and operating. And I became a part of the program in 1966. So Head Start, is really taking young kids at that time ages two and a half through age five. It's grabbing them at the very early stages of their development and it's a comprehensive program designed to teach kids developmental skills as well as the social skills that's needed in order to bridge the gap in society. So that they start out on an even kill, start out uh, learning their basics in terms of the alphabet, but not in such a way that it becomes boring. It's a fun uh, type of approach. It's a comprehensive program that also deals with the social ills of the family. It deals with the psychological uh, state of the child. It, it takes them sequentially through the learning process so that that child becomes a person who can compete on any level. And it gives them a sense of confidence because it's building the social graces of, building, of being with other children and learning how to cope with difficulties and relationships. So you have uh, a program that not just looks at the child, but it looks at the entire family. And that's why Head Start has thrived and survived throughout the years because of what it means to the community and to the family. It was a lot of anger, a lot of resentment. I couldn't understand it, but let me say that I never felt inferior to anyone. If anything, it made me more of a determined person, um, more of a person who, who says that I can, I can, I will, I must. Um, because I know that although my skin color may have been different, my character was just as good or greater than some of the other people who were there. As a matter of fact, I had the opinion that people who could do this to other people were not very nice people. 
and did not believe enough about themselves or believe in themselves very much. Otherwise, they would not see me as competition. You know, I look at the African American community and I see flavor, I see talent, I see life, I see festivity, I see a determination, I see a people who have overcome every possible obstacle from slavery on up till today. And I see a people who are magnificent, who are talented, who are skillful. I wouldn't trade any of my experiences from, for who I am for anything in this world, in this lifetime, because I think it's because of my history, because of who I am, it's made me who I am today and made me know how special my people really are. And that regardless to what may happen in life, we can and we will. Whatever it is, we can and we will. So that experience is not anything that should be taken lightly. I think that like the Jewish people, I often admire and respect how they have taken the history of the Holocaust, the history of their religion, and they never, ever let their children forget, nor should we ever let our children forget about our history and to appreciate the accomplishments and what others have gone through in order for us to be where we are today. So I am very proud to be an African American. I think that facing our youth today is a sense of who they are. You know, I think that uh, sometimes when we see children get into trouble, they open overcompensate because they don't feel good about themselves. And I think society has done a disservice in looking at low-income communities and not finding solutions to try and bridge the gap of low-income communities because self-esteem is one of the most critical aspects that a child needs in order to develop into a well-balanced human being. And when you tell that child time after time, you're not good enough, uh, you cannot do this or you cannot do that, you take away that child's ability to see themselves as a positive person contributing to society. So I think that we have to do as much as possible to let that child know, let that adolescent know, let that youth know that you are worthy, that you are somebody, that you can do things, that you have skills, and you can make a contribution to society. Greater Miami Service Corps seeks to do that. It takes the disenfranchised young adult between the ages of 16 to 23. It says to that child, even though you may have dropped out of high school, you can come back into the fold of doing community service. There are a lot of elderly people out there who need support, who need help. There are a lot of parks that need rebuilding. There are a lot of uh, public housing projects that need painting. There are a lot of sidewalks that need paving, that need to be um, revitalized. Greater Miami Service Corps seeks to give young people the experience of doing community service, while at the same time, Taking that young person who may have dropped out of school, getting them back in school, giving them a chance to get their GED, or if they have been fortunate enough and determined enough to finish high school but may not be working, it brings them back into the fold, give them those life skills that they need to become employable and help them find a job. At the end of the program, the program by the year, by the way, is a year long. At the end of the program, that kid who went through that program, we don't just let them graduate and leave. We make sure they're either in school or in college. And we provide them with a scholarship to help them in college. And make sure with employment, we don't just leave them there with the worker and say, OK, you're employed now. Bye bye, we're out of here. We check on them from three to six months to make sure that they're stable in the employment market. So it takes that young kid that dropped out of high school and it has given them a new direction. And you would be surprised at how much of a difference it makes in their lives. Greater Miami Service Corps. Yeah. Yeah, because here I took a concept 
um, that was a part of a national demonstration. I started out as the planner and I became the person who created the program and I took young people between the ages of 16 to 23 who were high school dropouts. Many of them had criminal backgrounds. Many of them may have been high school graduates but were not doing anything with their life. I led the process to turn those young people around along with the board of directors and a magnificent staff to turn the lives around of those young people to make them instead of being tax users to make them taxpayers and contribute to community and to believe in themselves. So if nothing else is accomplished in my life, that's my legacy, Greater Miami Service Corps.